Welcome, Trey. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. And you just presented on Prospera. So for our U.S. Transhumanist Party audience, uh, could you describe briefly the concept of a special economic zone in Honduras and some of the history of Prospera? Absolutely. No problem at all. And thank you so much for, uh, for the conversation. So Prospera is a special economic zone off the coast of Honduras on the island of Roatan. What that really means is you could think of it kind of like a municipality okay, in the United States, except this particular municipality has a number of uh, degrees of freedom, has a significant amount of autonomy from the central government's legal and regulatory environment. Uh, we're operating under a constitutional amendment that the Honduran Congress passed back in 2012 and 2013 uh, that effectively enables us to work closely with the Honduran government to form a brand new legal and regulatory system within this special economic zone to rapidly catalyze economic development and create prosperity for Hondurans and unleash innovation for entrepreneurs who look to operate in the jurisdiction. Uh, Prospera was uh, founded back in 2017. We were the first formally approved ZEDE. We spent uh, almost two years working very closely with the Honduran government and international legal and governance experts to build our uh, uh, governance and regulatory environment to make sure it was based on best practices from around the globe and that it would uh, maximize prosperity and, and economic freedom and therefore the ability to operate businesses within the jurisdiction. We've been operating for a few years now. Um, we, uh, we're over a thousand acres in size now. We have a number of buildings and companies that are operating inside the jurisdiction right now, especially focused on the cutting edge of biotech, longevity, and uh, things that are very compatible with the, uh, the kind of transhumanist movement as a whole. Yes, indeed. And we in the Transhumanist Party certainly welcome jurisdictional experimentation. One of our interests, apart from making individuals live longer, is to enable societies to last longer without descending into either chaos or tyranny. So what are some of the ways in which Prospera might help to fulfill that aim and hopefully itself endure for an extremely long time. Absolutely, I'd love to. I love this question. So let me start at the meta level for a second. Uh, kind of in, in speaking, both uh, kind of more personally here. Uh, one of the most important things about Prospera is that we are catalyzing competition in governance. Right? Uh, governance is a service that is currently provided by public entities, what we think of as political entities. Right. But governance in and of itself is a service. It's simply setting the rules of the game, enabling fair dispute resolution, and setting the rules by which people interact within a jurisdiction. One of the most important things that Prosper is catalyzing is a new competitive industry for governance as a service, right? We are one of the first movers in this industry. There are a number of other companies that are doing it right now. But our end goal, even if, uh, again, at a meta level here, even if we don't survive, but 20 years from now, there are a thousand new jurisdictions trying and experimenting with new, better forms of governance that I will have considered us a wild success in any case, right? The, the objective here was to catalyze this entire new industry of governance as a service to, to create competition for governance such that it improves rapidly over time the same way any other, any other industry that is exposed to, to competition in the marketplace improves over time. Now, Prosper specifically has been structured to last effectively forever. Uh, this is because we have a kind of a, a, a two, our, our legal structures, if you will, uh, are, are two tiered. There's two separate legal entities. We have the Prospera Zene, which is the political entity. Again, this is the municipality I was thinking of, I was mentioning earlier. It's the, the political legal jurisdiction, right? And then we have Honduras Prospera Inc., which is a, a Delaware C Corp. It's an American company, it's, it's the operating company, right? Uh, we provide the capital and a lot of the funding and the actual kind of work to start the jurisdiction. Uh, initially, that means we kind of set the initial rule set. Over time, our governance evolves to have more citizen input in such a way that we can ensure that the short-term interests of the jurisdiction are balanced with the long-term interests. I'll give you one like concrete example of this because I know that's a little abstract. Uh, the composition of the Prospera Council is a nine-member council. It's the governing entity of the jurisdiction. Okay? Uh, five of those council members are democratically elected by the residents, but four of them are appointed by the promoter and organizer of the jurisdiction, which is Honduras Prospera Inc. The reason for that is because almost everything substantial, meaning any statute or regulation or anything like that, requires a two-thirds majority vote of the council. What that means is you have the, the frankly, short-term focus, which for good and for ill, uh, democratically elected uh, members of the council who are focused on kind of the short-term benefits for their residents or, and for their constituents, uh, counterbalanced with the much longer-term view of Honduras Prospera Inc. as a private company, which wants to grow as profitable as possible, for as long as possible, right? To be a multi-century uh, extant company, effectively. 
So you have a balance of forces on the council where for, for any given piece of legislation and an important act to be done and, and, or passed, you have to have a balance of these interests, of the short-term interest and of the long-term interest. Uh, we're also the first jurisdiction to uh, implement something called double democracy, which effectively means, uh, the way this works mechanistically, anything the council passes, uh, the residents have the right to immediately veto via referendum within the 60-day window after that legislation is passed. They do this via a referendum that has to have a certain vote threshold. However, this effectively gives them a, a way to stop very bad legislation. If somehow, some way, the council becomes misaligned with the interests of the residents, they have the ability to stop that bad legislation in its tracks. However, they cannot create new legislation through referendum, which is often a, a mechanism for a majority rule in, in a very bad way. Uh, so we're the first jurisdiction to implement this, this innovative double democracy model as just a few examples of how we've ensured the long-term political and legal stability of the jurisdiction. Yes, this is very interesting. So it's kind of a mixed democratic model with small d democratic veto power. Usually veto power is held by an executive, but you've kind of inverted this, which is quite interesting as well. And I can see essentially how this would work from the standpoint of protecting individual rights, because this democratic veto power would be particularly inclined to be exercised in situations where a majority might perceive a, a certain vital right as being infringed upon. However, the lack of ability to propose positive legislation by referendum could prevent policies that, for instance, would redistribute wealth from one group of people to another. Exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, you can imagine, like, let's imagine for a second a, a worst case scenario, right? Let's say far in the future, let's imagine there's 10,000, 100,000 residents in Prospera, whatever the case may be. And for whatever reason, uh, say Honduras Prospera Inc. is no longer controlled by, by uh, the current group of people it's controlled by. It's been taken over by some hostile actor or whatever. And that hostile actor has somehow, some way, forced through some bad legislation, right? They've gotten some bad legislation through the, through the council. Well, because of this double democracy, you effectively have a check against either Honduras Prospera Inc. going rogue or the Democratic politicians going rogue uh, or the entire group going rogue, effectively. Uh, you, can, you can stop anything they do uh, in its tracks very early on because you have this immediate Democratic veto power. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons I, I, I hate this so much. There's, there's, there's always these, uh, there's been a few articles written by left-leaning publications who call us authoritarian, colonialist, whatever, but they don't realize because they never actually read anything that we do that we're, we're, if you just look at the raw facts, the most democratic jurisdiction in the world just implemented in a much more thoughtful way to ensure that individual rights are protected over the long term and that the, the citizens have a say in how they are governed but not in such a way that mob rule and majority rule can uh, cause wealth redistribution or, or other violations of property rights effectively and violations of individual rights over time. Yes, this is quite fascinating. Thank you for that answer. Now, one of the biggest threats to the longevity of an enterprise such as Prospera would be the intervention of the Honduran government in particular. And we know that in 2022, the new administration of Shirmara Castro essentially expressed deep opposition to the special economic zones and tried to shut them down. But you mentioned in your presentation that there was considerable pushback against that. And you believe that you have been successful in preserving the autonomy of Prospera. So could you please discuss more of what happened and why you believe that this threat has been averted for the time being? Absolutely. I'm going to go in the weeds a little bit here just because the details really matter. Uh, so the first thing to note is that the enabling legislation that allows the creation of ZEDES is comprised of two parts, a constitutional amendment and a statute, or the ZEDES Organic Law. The constitutional amendment, uh, just the way the Honduran legal system works, requires a two-thirds majority vote of Congress, a, a supermajority effectively, in two consecutive sessions of Congress to change the Honduran constitution to ensure there's not some short-term kind of impulsive action. Uh, now, the statute, of course, just being a regular statute, can be repealed at any time by a unilateral simple majority vote of Congress. Well, they almost immediately repealed the uh, enabling law, the, the organic law. But that, However, the founders of the, and the framers of this system were brilliant, and this, we had nothing to do with this, to be clear. These were just a few absolutely visionary uh, Honduran uh, politicians and, and, and actors. Uh, they anticipated this, that this, something like this would happen in the legislation. So what happens is, instead of the repealing of the organic law causing us to no longer be able to operate, all that means is no new ZAs can be formed. 
because all the real, all the organic law really did was was set out the rules and the system by which new ZAs were formed. So new ZAs can, no new ZAs can be formed, fine, but the constitutional amendment remains intact. The second repeal vote failed, which means it is it is protected effectively. It, it, it is still in is still part of the Honduran Constitution, and as a result, us and the other two extant ZAs, we're not the only one, uh, can continue to exist indefinitely. Where you can think of it as being grandfathered in effectively because we're already there, and the constitutional amendment uh, still exists. So that's the first point. The second point is that. Uh, the, the Castro administration was also hostile to a number of other private enterprises in, in Honduras. This is, there's been a lot of news written about this. I'm not sharing any private information here. Um, and there was kind of a grassroots uh, up, uprising, effectively, uh, welling of support from companies unrelated to us, just other private companies in Honduras, other American companies that have invested in Honduras, uh, because the Castro administration was, was not friendly to not just us, but a bunch of other private enterprise. Uh, so there was a pretty unified pushback by the business sector against many of the things she was doing that has resulted in her losing a, a considerable amount of political power. And as a result, she's not even running for re-election. And it looks like the opposition party, which is more market friendly, will end up uh, overtaking the, the presidency in the, in the upcoming uh, presidential election. The third point I want to make is we also had a number of legal protections in place because we are a U.S. company. We are, uh, therefore, we are party to and protected by CAFTA and a number of other international trade agreements and treaties. Uh, and an important part of that is uh, there's, a, there's a kind of established norm and uh, established in case law, international law, uh, that says basically uh, if a, a country invites another company from another country to invest in that country uh, and then, uh, based on a certain law, and then they repeal that law, that amounts to an expropriation. You can think of it, if you think of it just company to company, it makes a little more sense. It's like me saying, hey, I will uh, build you a building uh, and with a bunch of specialized equipment in it. And then I build you a building, I don't put any of the equipment in it, right? I just violated our contract, which is obviously wrong, and you could sue me, rightfully so. It works the same way. Uh, so we have, uh, as a result, sued the Honduran government at ICSID, the International Court of State Investor Dispute at the World Bank, for violating their treaty obligations under CAFTA and a few other treaties. Uh, and that case is going swimmingly, um, and we anticipate a, a favorable outcome from that as well. I can't share any, any details there, but suffice to say the combination of all of these things uh, has resulted in us continuing to operate completely unabated, and importantly, uh, this is kind of our most vulnerable time, right? We're, we're the smallest we're ever going to be right now, so it's the easiest to kind of try to push us over. Uh, the fact that we repelled the attack now means that any future attack will, will not be able to succeed effectively because our, our growth is extremely rapid. There's a bunch of people and companies setting up in the jurisdiction. Uh, and importantly, our, over 90% of the workforce in our jurisdiction is Honduran, and that will remain to be the case moving forward because, again, we exist to catalyze prosperity for Hondurans through innovation and entrepreneurship. And so because our jurisdiction is majority Honduran, as more companies come, as more Hondurans are employed, that becomes a, a political and voting block of itself uh, that, that can help to uh, have, again, a, a grassroots upswelling of support uh, to kind of stop such attacks in the future before they even happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And I agree that with the passage of time, Prospera's position will only become stronger. And I'm glad that you have these multiple layers of protections in place, both from a legal standpoint and the practical reality of the situation in Honduras, I do hope the administration there changes. Now, as a follow-up on that, do you think the culture of the rule of law is strong enough in Honduras that a future administration would not just decide to disregard the law altogether and despite your legal victories, uh, just choose to evict Prospera from the territory of Honduras because it can? Sure, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is no, I don't see this happening uh, basically ever. Uh, Honduran support for the rule of law, while not perfect, is better than you might suspect. Um, and importantly, uh, you, if you think about this just from a raw kind of uh, just brute incentives perspective, to be honest, uh, doing so would cause them massive harm because it only further strengthens any litigation we might bring against them in international court. Uh, which can massively harm them economically if the, the ICSID uh, arbitration rules against them. Um, and further, they because we are a U.S. company, that means by default we effectively have the backing of the, the U.S. government. There's a, this is a, and I'm not just saying anything that people don't already know. Like The State Department all the time helps companies in other countries uh, through diplomacy, statecraft, kind of just helping make sure that American companies are able to operate as intended in countries where they're, where they're working. Uh, the Honduran government is a, a, an enormous benefactor of U.S. generosity and a number of things that the United States does for them. Um, so kind of attacking us frontally that way uh, would have, again, I'm speculating here some, but I, I suspect would drastically 
uh, let's say, worsen diplomatic relations between the two countries, uh, perhaps in some tangible ways. I can give you some evidence for this already, uh, in that the, the United States actually revoked the visas of a few uh, Honduran politicians uh, because of some of the extremely inflammatory things they said and actions they took against not just us, but other American companies. I mean, for example, Dole has massive operations in Honduras for their fruit, their fruit farms. Um, so it's not just us here, to be clear. Um, so I, I, I suspect over the long term um, that this, this becomes less of an option um, as Honduras remains, uh, the, the importance of Honduran U.S. relations remains incredibly important. So this is quite interesting. The status of Prospera Honduras Inc. as a U.S. corporation actually aligns your interests with those of the U.S. federal government, and that can be a powerful ally to have on one side in situations that, like this. If, if I may for just a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, the, the whole reason we exist is to catalyze prosperity for Hondurans. Mm -hmm. And if you really kind of zoom out a little bit, the entire cause of the migration crisis from the Northern Triangle, which refers to Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador, uh, is caused by lack of economic opportunity. We know this, there's a bunch of academic research about this, and it makes sense in a dollar and cents perspective, right? Like the average national GDP of a Honduran is $3,500. The average annual income of a Honduran migrant living in the United States is over $30,000. They can basically 10x their income if they just hike a thousand miles north or, or find their way up there effectively. Um, so we are really solving the root cause of the migration crisis by creating economic opportunity for young Hondurans and re especially reducing brain drain of the best and brightest of Honduras. So right now the best and brightest of Honduras have to go somewhere else to, to really make the most of their, their talents and resources. But with Prospera, they can stay at home and achieve the same ends, achieve the same outcomes. I'll give you one small example. It's a good friend of mine named Ricardo Gonzalez. Uh, who's an attorney that works in Prospera, like just in the jurisdiction. And uh, Ricardo's a great guy. He went to a, a U.S. law school and was fully positioned as he was uh, finishing law school to move to the United States and, and work in, in, in law as an attorney in the United States. But once he found out about Prospera, he decided instead to move back to Honduras to live inside the jurisdiction to, and to help us grow as quickly as possible because he saw that the opportunity here was just as good as or much greater than if he went to the United States. So I know that's just one person and one example, but it really illustrates the point I'm making that uh, we are a solution to the migration crisis, which is consistently has been a, concern, a stated concern by the State Department and by uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations. Mm -hmm. And hopefully some wise decision makers in both of these current or potential administrations will realize this connection and will therefore be incentivized to assist Prospera. Now, one aspect that you discussed during your presentation is regulatory insurance, and I find this to be a fascinating concept for two reasons related to my background. First of all, I was a student during my college days of Dr. Robert P. Murphy when he was an economics professor. Huge fan, Bob. That's awesome. Yes, indeed. Uh, he actually has a blog post where he calls me his best student. That's amazing. So I'm familiar with his theories. Now, I myself am not an anarcho-capitalist. I incline more toward minarchism, and he and I have had a lot of written discussion back and forth back in 2005, no less. But I'm quite familiar with his idea of essentially insurance companies providing dispute resolution services in what is essentially an anarcho-capitalist society. But the other aspect of my background is I'm an actuary and I am familiar with a lot of insurance companies in the United States as a result of my professional experience. What I can say though is I cannot envision an established insurance company in the United States providing something like regulatory insurance. That would essentially be like asking a medieval knight to build a base on the moon. And the medieval knight may be good at what he does. He may be good on horseback, a good fighter, uh, no problem with him being a knight, but he can't envision the concept of a moon base. So where are you going to find these insurers to provide this regulatory insurance coverage, which is quite innovative in concept. First of all, I absolutely love that analogy. You hit the nail on the head because I've talked to a lot of insurance companies at this point, and yeah, you spot on. Um, so the first thing is we have in what we call the insurer of last resort. It's an insurance company we started ourselves and capitalized ourselves uh, such that in, in the case, which has been the case for the past year or so, there's no other insurance providers. There's at least us to kind of backstop the entire system and make it work. Uh, we've talked to I don't know how dozens, well, some put it that way, dozens of insurance companies in the US and abroad. 
from people as names we've recognized, like Lloyd's London, uh, all the way down to some smaller, kind of more innovative insurance companies. And uh, a few of them are very interested. Uh, and basically, the response we got from them, and you'll, this will come as zero surprise to you, was like, uh, why don't you guys have an insurance company, right? Well, send us your actuarial data after five years, and then we'll look at it. Uh, so fair enough. I understand there, like you said, it's medieval night. They're, they're, they have to uh, be 100% certain exactly how it's going to work before they ever set foot. Uh, so well, that's what we've been doing. We've been collecting uh, copious amounts of data uh, to, to explain kind of how we're insuring things, keeping, uh, keeping track of any disputes, although there hasn't been any yet, but keeping track of, of that, all that sort of stuff. And in the next few years, we will take that data and basically shop it around to the insurance companies to say, look, here's the product we need. Uh, here is the data on exactly how this works. And uh, here's how it's performed so far. Let's see what you got. And there have been a few companies that have already told us very explicitly, you bring us five, six years of actuarial data, then yeah, we'd be happy to do this. Yes, insurers... Traditional insurers rely on large volumes of data because they want, ideally, the law of large numbers to apply to the products that they're pricing. However, of course, when you have an innovative product like this, by definition, you don't have that kind of data. So the insurer has to take a calculated risk of a sort that at least traditional methodologies are not equipped to quantify. So they have to be innovative. And I'm curious, have there been any insurers other than your company of last resort domiciled anywhere or new startup entities that went ahead and said, we're willing to take that risk. We're willing to provide this coverage even while more robust data are accumulated. Not yet, unfortunately. Um, we anticipate this will probably remain the case for at least two years. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the most kind of cutting edge, innovative companies we've talked to said we only need a couple years of actuarial data and then we'll, we'll be happy to, to step into this market. Um, which is fine with us, to be honest, because uh, there's another aspect of this, right? So uh, the, the regulatory insurance, uh, by the way, for those that don't know, is just simply covering, all it covers is uh, in the event that a company they insure is found uh, by our dispute resolution mechanisms, to have been violating the regulatory code they selected, well then they have to pay the damages for having done that, right? Um, and the insurance company has to cover that. So that's, the, that's what it is insuring, regulatory, it, it, the regulatory violations effectively. Um, well, we uh, are, do not anticipate that happening that much in the first few years, more or less, uh, because there's, a, there's another aspect of this, which is that we uh, intentionally kind of filter uh, what sort of businesses and, and people moving into the jurisdiction. That's not to say we're arbitrarily kicking people out or anything like that, far from it. We just have a very uh, transparent but robust filtering mechanism for people to come to the jurisdiction. Uh, so to get an e-residency and therefore, or a physical residency and therefore form a legal entity, you have to pass a criminal background check uh, that is pretty robust. So because of that, it just dissuades kind of bad actors initially. When you combine that with the fact that uh, most of the time people that are good faith actors in these innovative spaces are just good people, we quite literally have not had a single regulatory infraction yet. Like nobody has violated their regulatory code yet. It hasn't happened. Uh, I'm sure it'll happen, like there'll be a few cases over the next few years, and we, we actually need it to, to collect that data, so I hope someone does eventually, at least on a small scale, um, but it hasn't happened yet. So I'm not too concerned about the fact that we're the only insurer for the next few years, uh, because it's only going to take us a few years to get the data other insurers have told us they need to step into the market, and just the community we've attracted uh, has, is, are just good faith actors that they don't, buy, they, don't, uh, they don't break their obligations. Yes, and often there could be informal ways of preventing or resolving certain disputes. Uh, I found in my experience before pursuing any sort of formal process, it's often easier just to talk to all of the parties involved and make sure the interests are aligned or even, let's say, simulate the outcome of a dispute resolution process and get all parties to understand what that outcome is likely to be because conflicts of any nature, including wars and litigation, tend to arise when various parties have dramatically different expectations of the outcome, and each party thinks it has the upper hand, when, of course, in reality, it may be much messier than that. I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. No, look, I mean, again, these haven't happened yet. I suspect we'll probably get a handful of them over the next few years. To be totally honest, I hope one happens at some point soon, just so we have the data. Like we need to, we need to run somebody through the whole process, to the dispute resolution process and the, the insurance process, um, just to kind of get a get a feel for how to how to optimize that process internally. Um, so uh, uh, this sounds backwards, but I'm hoping someone actually violates that regulatory code at some point over the next few years, so we have some data to give to an insurer. But it just hasn't happened yet. So one aspect of complexity that 
might increase the probability of this somewhat is the choice of regulatory code that you give to businesses and Prospera. Could you perhaps explain in greater detail how that works and what the range of choices is? I would assume they wouldn't be able to select the laws of the People's Republic of North Korea, for correct, example. Correct. Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there are three kind of buckets of options entrepreneurs can choose from. Um, option one is they can pick the regulatory code for their particular industry of one of the OECD countries. So obviously, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development is basically most of the developed nations in the world. And because they're developed, they often have fairly robust regulatory environments for any given industry. So again, that's, one, that's kind of the first pass option that most people end up going with. They just pick the country that they like the best that has the best regulatory code for them. Uh, option two is uh, what we call the kind of safe harbor provision or regulatory election provision. This is where they can uh, propose their own regulatory code. So the way that process works very briefly so is if an entrepreneur is not happy with any of those OECD options, they can say, look, I have a bet. This has already happened a few times. Uh, so this, this process has been kind of proven out. They say, look, I'm not happy with any of these. Here's my proposed new regulatory code for my industry or my particular type of business, basically. We then pass that along to a number of subject matter experts on that industry. So like for finance, for example, we've had a bank go through this process. Uh, it was reviewed by a, one of the former executive directors of the FDIC in the United States. It was reviewed by the former chief strategy officer of the Dubai International Financial Center. So we run this by kind of like best in the world, literally experts on that particular area. Uh, a medical company has done the same thing, a medical regulatory election. We had that reviewed by several PhD biochemists and, uh, and medical doctors who operate in the industry, um, as well as a few FDA regulators reviewed those things just to make sure, uh, again, these were, these were not going to, to cause some sort of uh, extreme unintended consequences that we weren't prepared for. And assuming they pass those checks in that review, Prosper Council will then vote on this. If it is passed, that is now a new regulatory option for any business operating in that industry. So it's not like they can carve out their own unfair advantage, uh, and that's something that Prosper Council filters heavily for. Uh, if they create a better regulatory code for that industry, that's great. That should be an option for everyone, and it is once it's passed by the, by the, the, the council. Uh, the third option is kind of the, what we call the default regulatory option or the common law option. Um, so our, our legal code is based on uh, American common law. And because of that, it has already has some pretty robust built-in protections against things like, you know, fraud, uh, even things like money laundering. Obviously, direct like contract violations or physical harm, assault, that all that sort of stuff. Um, so that option is kind of a higher risk, higher reward option that some people choose. The way it works is uh, they uh, do not have any sort of kind of direct prescriptive regulation relevant to their specific industry, besides a few specific exceptions I can talk about if you want me to. Uh, but if they are found guilty of having violated uh, someone's rights and therefore broken a law of some sort uh, and caused harm, then they are liable for what are called treble damages, so 3x damages based on the, the ruling of the arbitration center, as well as piercing of the corporate veil for corporate officers, meaning they are personally, individually liable for these violations. So it's very high risk, high reward, so that's the third option. Mm -hmm. Now we've had a number of companies uh, choose any of the three options that, have, uh, that we've, we've presented for them so far. Um, I forget the other part of your question, but that's, the, that's how it works in a nutshell. Yes, uh, so essentially this is quite fascinating. And to follow up on it, with regard to this high risk, high reward option, what are some of the exceptions? You said uh, essentially there are very few specific prohibitions, but there are some. So totally. what would they be? Happy to give you a few of these. I actually can't remember every one of them because there's a, we have, uh, if you go to Prospera Zede, so P R O S P E R A Z E D E dot H N, you can read every law or statute, anything the council's ever done. It's published there publicly as soon as it happens, basically. Uh, transparency is one of our core values. So you can go look at this there and then correct me if I've made a mistake here, but uh, the industrial regulatory statute, the industrial regulation statute stipulates a few exceptions. Uh, the first is uh, related to pollution. So if you're a company producing a particulate matter that is known like very solid science, not some fringe California stuff, but like very solid science proven to immediately rapidly harm people, you just, you just can't do that. Well, you can't have, uh, can't be pouring sulfur into the atmosphere, for example. Um, and the, the, I don't remember the specific chemicals. There's a number of specific chemicals and particulate thresholds that are listed uh, on, in, in that statute. So it's not just also a blanket ban. It's a, there are thresholds there for particular matter. Um, some other examples include, like, you can't do gain-of-function research on viruses, stuff like that. I mean, pretty straightforward. Like, you can't create COVID. Um, and a few other exceptions related to nuclear power and, like, weapons development. Uh, but that's basically it. It's just effectively you can think of it as covering, like, absolute worst-case scenarios that maybe we will modify this once we're very big, right? And there's a lot of activity going on and we, this, this regulatory insurance industry is very robust. 
then we can maybe open it up to some of these more risky things. But for now, in our early stages, those are just no-goes. Yes, these seem to be very sensible limitations. So thank you for clarifying those. Now, two final questions for you. First of all, if somebody wants to be involved with Prospero or take advantage of any of the opportunities it presents, what are some of the readily available ways right now? Totally. So the first option is you can go to eProspero.hm and go get a, a digital e-residency. This gives you immediately the right to form a legal entity in Prospero, the right to visit Prospero for up to, I can't remember if it's 30 or 60 days, but quite a while basically, um, and, and be part of the jurisdiction effectively. Um, the reason we do that, uh, this is an aside, but I think your audience will find this interesting, uh, is because we've made the social contract explicit. So to become a member of the jurisdiction, you have to sign something called an agreement of coexistence that says explicitly you agree to the existing rules as they are in the governance structures that promulgate said rules. Uh, so instead of having this kind of uh, flawed Lockean concept of some sort of an implicit uh, consent to, to governance you never consented to, you have to uh, explicitly consent. And if you don't sign this, no harm, no foul, but you can't come and prosper because you didn't agree to the rules that are there. Um, so because of that, that's what the e-residency is for, just to explain briefly why that's there. Um, and gives you access to our governance institutions, the Prosper Arbitration Center, forming legal entities, all that good stuff, and physical access as well, of course. So eProsper.hn is one option. Uh, you can go to Prosper.hn just to sign up for our mailing list more broadly. Uh, but the way I would encourage most people to engage with Prospera is if you have the opportunity, just come visit. Uh, it's a beautiful island. If nothing else, it'll be a great vacation for you. We have the world's second largest barrier reef is literally like 100 yards off of our property. Um, there's, a, there's a cool shipwreck actually about a, a 300 yards off the property you can go scuba dive on. There's a scuba shop in the jurisdiction that'll, that'll take you out there and a few other places. Uh, so one of the best ways to experience it is go see for yourself. Come, come visit. We have a, a hotel, a couple of restaurants, um, and there are a number of ways to, to kind of get in there. Um, so if you just go to, again, prosper.hn, you'll be able to find resources that'll, that'll guide you to that. Um, you can also Google things like Pristine Bay, which is the name of the resort, Pristine Bay Roatan, um, and find the book a hotel room from there and just come visit. Uh, and see it for yourself. Excellent. I'm sure many of our viewers will appreciate this kind invitation. And my last question for you is, you've been at Longevity Summit Dublin. This is the end of day three. What are your impressions thus far? Oh, it has been absolutely incredible. The, the first impression is, and I, this happens to me every time I go to a, a conference like this, it's incredibly humbling insofar as I'm reminded of how many people there are in the world, like in order of magnitude more intelligent than I am. This has been one of the, the most uh, intellectually sharp groups of people I have ever met. Uh, two, the state of longevity research was, I, I've been following this field fairly closely, I thought, and this is still far ahead of and more advanced than anything I would have imagined. The, the progress has been so rapid, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, and I've just been uh, very, uh, very glad to be here. I've met a bunch of incredibly fascinating people. Uh, it's been an incredible group and an incredible experience. And I've learned an enormous amount uh, along the way. I've had a, I've had a chat GPG, uh, chat open basically the entire time asking it questions about some of the, the medical stuff they've been discussing trying to get up to speed quickly yes indeed and of course i think you are one of the intellectually erudite people who comprise this community I appreciate it. and we are honored to have you here at longevity summit dublin and to discuss this extremely innovative concept in jurisdictional experimentation i wish you all the best in prospera and i hope to visit myself someday absolutely thank you so much and you as well all right thank you